I'd like to begin by sharing this with you, and it came to me courtesy of Dr. Andrew Elder, who you'll hear from tomorrow. And I want to say that we're all here, I believe, because we fundamentally feel that a patient manifesting this sort of thing should be recognized as having raised jugular venous pressure, a large V-wave of tricuspid regurgitation, and atrial fibrillation. And what a shame if 100 years after Osler's death, we are no longer training students and residents to be able to recognize that. So that is, I think, the thing that links us all. We're all hoping that our students, our trainees, will have a skill that is timeless and, and important. So my function in the next few minutes, uh, thanks to John, is to give you an introduction to what's ahead for the next two days and tell you a little bit about the history of our efforts in bedside medicine here at Stanford. And I'm reminded of the phrase by, by Heckel that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, meaning the development of the embryo recapitulates the whole evolution of the species. And in many ways, your journey the next two days recapitulates our seven-year voyage. And I hope you'll humor me while I take you very quickly through that. So uh, I had the good fortune to come here in 2007. And when I did, I was struck by the fact that more than any other place I'd been to, uh, because our electronic medical record was well established, I found that the house staff were spending a great deal of time wedded to the computer. Uh, and uh, it was not their doing. Let me make this very clear. That is our fault that they are spending all their time in front of the computer. They didn't sign up to do that. And I wrote this seminal paper in the New England Journal of Medicine where I coined the term the eye patient, like your iPhone and your iPad. And I didn't realize how influential that paper would be, maybe because I'm in Silicon Valley uh, and it made a lot of enemies, I suspect, amongst Silicon Valley folks. But I said that the patient in the bed has become almost an icon for the real patient who's in the computer, and I termed that the eye patient. Around that time, it became apparent to me that there was a very easy way to gauge how well we're doing in training our residents. So when I have a chance to visit other programs, uh, people know that I love seeing patients and they'll take me to the bedside and I'll often throw out a little litmus test, just a little measure of uh, how well I think they're doing. Uh, and I would ask them to do the ankle reflex on this bedridden patient. And ladies and gentlemen, it's amazing how very often no one in the room has a reflex hammer. And yet if you biopsy the chart at that moment, it would say ankle three plus, knee four plus, jaw jerk six plus. I like fiction, I read fiction, I even write fiction. <laughs> I just don't think it has a place in the medical record. So our giving you the reflex hammer that's in your bag with some other goodies is symbolic. We, we, we give it to our residents on the very first day they arrive here because frankly, there is no better way to test for significant neuropathy than to find absent reflexes. What a shame if you send someone for an EMG because you don't have the tool or the technique. So this became a metaphor. In fact, this photograph is very representative because if you tried to do the reflex exam that way, you'd have no success at all. You have the wrong hammer, the wrong position of the foot. There's so many things wrong with it. And I'll come back to the metaphor. I was also very fortunate to meet John when he was a uh, chief resident and a resident, and to meet uh, another resident of the same vintage, Brooke Cotter. And John and Brooke were very enthusiastic, always pulling me to the bedside assembling teams. And we began a regular <clears throat> bedside rounds for the chief residents on Thursdays, along with my rounds with the students on Wednesdays here, Fridays at the VA. And I should say, uh, John really took this up with a great deal of enthusiasm. Uh, I should also say that I've only once, uh, one other time in his lifetime or mine, have I seen him without his bicycle bag and with a tie? <laughs> because he's always with that bicycle bag. You should know about John that he goes everywhere by bicycle. In fact, on his wedding day, uh, he took his bride, Brooke Cotter, around on a bicycle. So John, I'm very proud of you. It is the same tie, I think, though. <laughs> but John was really inspirational in sort of solidifying the hunger represented by young junior faculty trying to learn a skill uh, that is what brought me to medical school, that, that sense of excitement at the bedside. 
Our next uh, landmark was we had a big bedside medicine conference here in 2008. And we had some very eminent guests. We had Steve McGee, who you will hear from later, and his wonderful book, Evidence-Based Physical Diagnosis, is in your, in your book bag. And we also had Jerry Kassirer, who's uh, the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. He comes here every month as a visiting professor. We had David Simmel and, and um, uh, Drummond Rennie, who write the JAMA Rational Clinical Exam. We had all the luminaries in bedside medicine. We had the ACGME folks, the LCME folks. And we ended the meeting with the recognition that these skills are valuable. We're not teaching them as well as we should. And I think we all came away without a unified vision of what to do. But at Stanford, in my conversations with John and Brooke, we came up with this idea of the Stanford 25. And for me, the metaphor was a stick shift. Uh, I have three boys. Uh, the oldest is 30, the youngest is now 18, just turned 18 a few days ago. And as they were growing up, I did everything in my power to prevent them from driving my car. <laughs> and I set all kinds of hurdles, hoping they would just give up and stick to bicycles like John. Uh, but I, my, my requirement was that they drive the stick shift, that they learn how to change a tire, and that they know how to change the oil. Now you might think, big deal, why, why, what does that do? Well, I think if you drive a stick shift and you know how to change a tire and you know how to change the oil, you know, you have some sense of the machine. It's not as though you're just driving a sofa down the freeway, you know? <laughs> because otherwise, you know, a big American car, automatic transmission, it's, you just float down the freeway with no sense of how much damage you can do or, you know, what's involved. Whereas, I think appreciating a little bit of the technique of this complex machine gives you a sense for it. And that was our metaphor. We did not want to teach physical diagnosis all over again. But we thought, if we can pick 25, not the top 25, just 25 technique-dependent maneuvers and make, make residents appreciate how technique matters. If you have the wrong technique, you won't get the result you want. If we can do that, we can then elevate technique in general and bring an excitement to their developing their own skills. Another seminal moment for us is because we then began teaching the Stanford 25 at morning reports sporadically. And with Errol Osdalga, who you'll also see a lot of, uh, Errol is sitting right here in the front row, do you want to just wave? Uh, with Errol, we had a retreat in my, in my uh, house, in my apartment at the time, where we invited senior residents to sort of tell us what could we do to make the Stanford 25 teaching sessions better. And by then, at that time, it was just a small group of us doing the teaching. And one of the things they said, right off the bat was they wanted a website, uh, which if you think about it is kind of a anachronism because uh, we've always felt that this is only taught one-on-one -on -one at the bedside. It's not something you can get off the web or off the page. Nevertheless, they felt that for something to exist in real life, it also had to have its counterpart on the screen, so to speak. And we took that to heart and uh, Errol took the lead on that and he developed a a very vigorous, a very robust Stanford 25 website and a very robust blog. We get five to 7,000 hits per day. Uh, and we never anticipated how important that is. And all credit to Errol for making that happen. Our blog is very vibrant. I'd invite you to log on. We're hoping that many of you, maybe even all of you, will have some con contribution to make to us uh, for the blog. Uh, it gives, it's a nice credit to you. It's wonderful for us. And you'll have 7,000 readers per day, uh, if that's a good incentive for you. Um, the next milestone was to also expand Morning Report to make it much more regular. And for that to happen, someone has to take ownership. And Errol took ownership. He just said, okay, every other Thursday we are doing Morning Report. And he expanded the pool of faculty. I won't say more about that because he's going to talk about that later this afternoon, except to say uh, you need to delegate these specific functions and have someone take ownership for it to work. One of the metaphors that uh, started for us very early on, almost with that ankle reflex metaphor, is what we call the five minute bedside moment, or 5M squared as we think about it. And what do I mean by that? Um, the ankle reflex is a good example. You can teach the ankle reflex in five minutes. And if you choose to, you can expand it to much longer. And we recognize that many young faculty 
want to go and teach at the bedside, but they would often say, you know, I don't feel like I have that much more to offer the senior resident than what I know. And we would encourage them to just try and build up a repertoire of five minute bedside moments. Think of them as building blocks and you add up these blocks and eventually you will have uh, quite a robust set of skills. And at any moment, at any bedside, no matter what the patient has, you can trot out your favorite little thing and get a conversation going. And we will be demonstrating that in the very next session. So that was an important moment for us. We've also been blessed to progressively add on mostly young hospitalists who got excited by this. Uh, Jeff Chi has been our, our sort of literary uh, person doing much of the important seminal papers that have come from our group and taking the lead on that, uh, for which we're very grateful. Uh, Poonam Hasamani, who you'll also meet all these folks. Poonam is right here. I don't know where Jeff is. Um, somewhere in the back. Jeff is in the back. Poonam uh, took on the role of leading our, our residency pod group. So we have uh, a new program in our residency where residents identify pathways of distinction. And we have 12 residents right now who have chosen clinical education as their pathway of distinction. Uh, she leads that effort. She also leads all our uh, medical student education efforts that are sort of elective type things. And our hope is that those 12 will get really, really skilled. And she's also leading the effort along with um, Maya Artandi in evaluating those folks. So it's one thing to teach the skills, but how do you test that they have it? Uh, so adding Maya, who's got a very strong interest in the outpatient setting, Poonam, and both of them interested in evaluation has been powerful. And we have the great benefit of one of our uh, beloved physicians here, Lars Osterberg, who's joined our uh, core group. He's an uh, internist, a specialist in the care of the homeless, and brings his wisdom and experience to all our efforts. And in talking about evaluation, about two years ago, we were very fortunate to uh, get to know Dr. Andrew Elder, who you'll meet uh, next, uh, next tomorrow, mostly. And Andrew heads the MRCP examination for the UK. So in the UK, you have a high stakes clinical exam, only about 60% pass the first time, uh, where they test your clinical skills on real patients. And Andy has run that program internationally. He personally has examined 2,000 physicians at the bedside with real patients. Uh, most of us struggle uh, to watch a resident do an h &P. So it's like watching paint dry. It's quite hard. So you have to admire his discipline for doing that. And we're very uh, fortunate to have another MRCP uh, in our group, and that's Dr. Junaid Zaman, who's uh, uh, here on a postdoc. He's a cardiologist. Andy came here on sabbatical two years ago, has come back for this, has really become an integral part of our group and they add the evaluation component to that program. And last but not least, and I'm gonna leave a lot more acknowledgements to John, because as you can tell, a program like this doesn't happen with a lot of help, uh, but in our core group, making a lot of this happen is uh, Sonu Tadani, our executive director. Sonu, where are you? Are you at the back? And uh, you know, without her magic, I don't think we would have taken on an enterprise like this. And so you will see her around, and she really is uh, the catalyst that keeps this all going. Uh, I haven't mentioned many, many other important people, but we're gonna get to them at the very end. This was more about history. And so I hope that that takes you, in a sense, through our ontogeny. And now I wanna relate that to your schedule. So the next thing on the agenda is really going to be the five minute bedside moment, the, the building block, so to speak. So we are going to talk briefly about it, and then you'll see three demonstrations of the five-minute bedside moment. I will do one on clubbing, pitched at the medical student level. Uh, Dr. Steve McGee is going to do one on the patient with Parkinson's, and then John is going to do uh, ultrasound. John has become uh, really our ultrasound maven. Uh, he teaches ultrasound all over, all over the place, but especially to all of us. Uh, and, and that'll be three demonstrations of the five-minute bedside moment, the molecule, if you will. And then after break, John will speak about the unique challenges of being a young attending physician and coming to the bedside, trying to find ways to make things work at the bedside. He will share his, his wisdom there with you. And then uh, Dr. Steve McGee will talk about how you teach evidence-based physical diagnosis at the bedside. And then we'll break for lunch. 
After lunch, uh, you will hear from Errol. Errol will talk about what it's taken to build a regular morning report every other Thursday around the Stanford 25 theme and the mechanics of how it works, successes and failures. And then he will do, uh, then we will do three Stanford 25 demonstrations. So he will do the ophthalmology exam and pulses paradoxus. We will then break out into the next room, which you will see is uniquely set up with individual tables at which you'll be seated with your group and examining tables on the side. And you will practice these two things uh, if you choose to. I don't want to sound dictatorial. And we will be around to, to help you. And again, we know you know how to do this. The focus is on pedagogy. How do you teach this? And then we'll come back to this room. There'll be three more demonstrations. Uh, the knee exam uh, by Poonam, the thyroid exam by Dr. Gesundheit, one of our uh, endocrinologists and a lovely clinician. And then I will demonstrate reflexes. And then once again, we will go back to the small group room over there and practice. Uh, actually, Errol, I think all of it's happening in the other room. After lunch, we're going to just be staying there, or are we coming here? Come here for demonstration. And then go back. Yes, OK. So there's a little bit of back and forth, but uh, as, as little as we can. And then we'll have a wonderful dinner. And I hope you will enjoy our panelists, who will include uh, uh, Dr. Prober, our Dean of Education, and one of our star medical students whose journey I think you'll be interested to hear. Uh, he may or may not actually ever finish medical school, but it's probably a good thing for mankind because what he's on to is even better. Um, tomorrow, you will have Dr. Elder, along with Dr. Janet Zaman, uh, demonstrate what it's like to have a high-stakes clinical exam. So we will have a patient with real findings, uh, Dr. Elder, who's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, and myself, and I'm an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, but I did pass a similar exam in Canada, so I'm an FRCP from Canada. We will be the examiners, and we will concur on the findings that a patient has. We will then invite Dr. Zaman to come be the student, and we will examine him, and you guys get to evaluate. So this is adding the evaluation component to the whole thing. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.